right, y'all ready to go? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get going with the West Haymarket Joint Public Agency meeting for today. Uh, with me today are Tim Clare and Doug Emery. Uh, and uh, the first item of business, of course, is, as always, is to let you know that the open meetings law is posted in the back of the room and that this meeting will be conducted in accordance with those rules. Uh, agenda item number two, uh, we are accepting, uh, by way of reports and communications, received a letter from BKD uh, summarizing certain plan scope and timing of the audit. Uh, no action is required on this. I assume nobody's speaking to this today. Uh, Steve, okay. Uh, please take note of that. Uh, agenda item number three. Uh, well, let me say before we uh, go to agenda item number three, uh, with the uh, consent of my colleagues here, agenda items eight and nine uh, will be taken off. The agenda for today to be given a little further review and we'll pick that up uh, pick those items up at our next meeting uh, so then we can go back to agenda item number three the 2014 JPA meeting schedule adoption uh, uh, Trish do I have that in my folder all right uh, what what is it under? Okay, I've got Regent Claire's schedule, uh, and Doug, you have one mm -hmm. also. All right. So, does that schedule look agreeable to you, gentlemen? Fine. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that we need to formally. Uh, adopt it so uh, if you all will keep track of that schedule that will be our schedule uh, unless uh, specifically we s specifically agree otherwise with respect to an individual date thank you Tim uh, agenda item number four uh, just to again inform you that uh, public comment is in, is invited on all these agenda items of necessity, of course, we, we need to have a time limit of, of uh, five minutes on individual uh, speeches, um, but we do welcome public uh, comment. The agenda item number five, approval of the minutes of the JPA meeting held on October 4th, 2013. Um, do I have a recommendation? with respect to approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Call the roll. Amory? Yes. Claire? Yes. Beitler? Yes. Minutes are approved. Next item is uh, uh, relates to the approval of the September and October 2013 payment registers. Steve Hupka is speaking to those. Yes, we have two months for this particular meeting of payment registers. For September, it was ten million three hundred sixteen one seventy-two and eighty-seven cents. Uh, primarily made up of uh, the big ones were Mortensen four and a half million and Houseman one point two million. And for October, it was seven million one fifteen oh eighty-two sixty-two. And there was some big ones there. Three point two million for Mortensons, five hundred thirty-seven thousand for Sampson's and three hundred thirty-six thousand for Houseman. And what I might mention about both these months' pay registers is we're transitioning from paying from the for construction payments. A uh, large part of the line items on these uh, expenditure reports are for furniture, fixtures, and equipment, as you might expect as the arena got closer to opening, there was a um, huge amount of equipment and various types of items that um, were purchased that arrived and were paying for them on these uh, payment registers. And you'll see that there's, and where you normally see descriptions there because of the fact that these were paid on purchase orders, the system that generates these reports 
uh, doesn't put a remark in there when it's off of a purchase order rather than payment voucher. But uh, there's a lot of different vendors that we haven't seen in past months because, again, they're supplying furniture, fixture, and equipment rather than construction type expenditures. So those are the, the two months payments re registers. And Steve, from uh, your standpoint, uh, all the signatures and, and uh, were placed in the right place and the contracts and procedures, et cetera, all that was, was reviewed and the procedures followed? Yes, and I might add that uh, the purchasing division was really heavily involved with just the number of things uh, during these two months, or the payments that were made during these two months, uh, a lot of this stuff took place over the summertime. And but where do these expenditures uh, fall in relation to the budget for phase one? They're in within the budget. Thank you. Okay, it's been uh, move approval. Second been moved and seconded to approve the payment registers. Any further discussion? Call the roll. Amory? Yes. Claire? Yes. Beitler? Yes. They stand approved. Uh, review of the September and October expenditure reports. Again, Steve Hupka. Once again, these, these reflect the expenditures that were made. Um, we are going to have, and you uh, put off for a month uh, the amendments to the program budget, the capital budget. So when that is approved, then those uh, particular changes will put in the budget column of these reports. And I might point out that if you look at the operating budget, uh, the budget column is blank at the current time because we haven't adopted a, an operating budget, but we continue to operate in current expenditures. So the Operating budget, when it is considered and adopted, will um, you know, have the budget to cover those items. Okay, questions to Steve? Is there public comment on the expenditure reports? And Jane, I apologize to you. I think we, I think I failed to note public comment on the previous item. If you'd like to comment on the previous item, we can always reconsider that too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I didn't know whether to speak to that because uh, you are coming down to something else. So, um, how much is the girder failure going to cost? Is, has that been arrived at, or has that uh, still ongoing? How much will it cost the city of Lincoln? Well, I know that it'll be reimbursed, uh, but at this time, how much is that that the city has spent? Paula, can you do you have any figures with you today, or would you provide them to Jane shortly? I can provide them with me. Okay, you okay. send them over today, if possible. Okay, and you'll have to come back to get approval for reimbursement, et cetera, correct? So that we will know an end result at some point, correct? Okay. Um, I think it's good for the public to know what that, where it's going at this point. Okay, I don't have anything else. Okay, thank you. Is there any further public comment? If not, do I have a motion? Well, I guess we don't need to adopt the expenditure reports, so we'll move on to agenda item number 10, WH 1392, resolution approving contract agreement with Commonwealth Electric with regard to certain Wi-Fi improvements. Uh, Paula, good morning. Good morning, and happy birthday, Mayor. Thank you. Um, uh, res it that way. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> gotcha. Um, resolution of 1392 is for approval of Commonwealth Electric to provide the cabling infrastructure required for the Wi-Fi system at the Pinnacle Bank Arena. If you remember, earlier this summer we approved the design and equipment portion of this work, and the company has been in the building for um, the past couple months doing their design, their layout, their signal strength testing, 
Um, and so now that we have the actual design, the cabling was put out for bid um, through the purchasing department. Commonwealth was the low bidder. Um, and therefore, we recommend approval to Commonwealth for the contract amount of $129,180. And this contract will be funded from the FF&E budget in the Pinnacle Bank arenas. Can you go through the timing of when you anticipate not only, because I, I believe it's, it's two, broken into two pieces. One is, is telephony and the other is, is the, the, uh, the DAS. The, the DAS system um, are from Boingo Wireless, which is a separate contract. Um, they're indicating that it will be up on November 23rd, so okay. next Friday, okay. I believe is that date. Than the Wi-Fi? The Wi-Fi right now, they're anticipating worst case scenario um, early March. However, if they're able to get in there and get things done quicker, they're, or equipment gets here sooner, they're hoping maybe even sooner. But right now, March would be the latest time frame. Is this the last contract on the ARENA internal communication systems altogether? Yeah, it should be. Is this, was it anticipated that it was going to take this long to get this done? Because it seems like that was, this has kind of been slow in, in, the, in the process. Probably a little bit slower than originally anticipated, yes. Explanation? Um, you know, SMG has been working along with the vendors and trying to um, get the design completed and equipment ordered. And um, at this point in time, it's hoping to get it done earlier, but March is the date at the worst case, so it's just, you know, how, how the... Help that we opened the arena early and SMG, SMG resources were somewhat diverted. Correct, and just, you know, timing and... Okay. But they're working on it. And this is the last piece of that puzzle. All right, uh, thank you, Paula. Is there public comment on item number 10? If not, do I have a motion to approve WH 1392? Second. Seconded, further discussion? Call the roll. Emery? Yes. Claire? Yes. Beitler? Yes. Resolutions approved. Agenda item number 11, WH 1393. <clears throat> having to do with bond issuance uh, requirements and the modification thereof. Just like to introduce Scott Keene from Emeritus Investment Corp and Mike Rogers from Gilmore and Bell and let them take this item. Good morning. Uh, this spring the board approved a resolution authorizing the issuance of up to $30 million of bonds for the uh, arena and related infrastructure improvements at a true interest cost of not to exceed 4.5% and a dollar amount not to exceed $30 million. At the time that, that that resolution was approved, we did not know exactly how much would need to be financed. We were still working through a lot of the numbers, but, and also we didn't know how much of it might need to be financed on a taxable basis. The tax folks from Gilmore Bell have completed their analysis and determined that we don't have to issue any bonds on a taxable basis. So what we are here today to do is to talk about an amendment to the resolution that would allow us to bump the not to exceed true interest cost up from 4.5% to 5.25% because since spring, as we've all seen in the market, interest rates have risen fairly dramatically and, and happened fairly quickly when the Federal Reserve indicated that they might not, continuing, might not continue the quantitative easing uh, that they've been doing over the last two years. Um, in the current market, if we were to sell the bonds today, we would expect the, the bonds to have a true interest cost of anywhere from 4.25 to 4.4 percent. So we would still be meeting the parameter that this board approved last spring, but with very little margin for, for interest rate movements. It is our intent to be going to market with a competitive sale of these bonds through an electronic auction process on Wednesday, December 4th. So we're just about three weeks away from that sale. We don't expect rates to move a lot between now and then, but we can't go to market and have bidders submit bids that we then have to reject 
because we barely miss our parameter of 4.5%, our maximum parameter of 4.5%. So again, we are asking today to, ha to have the board approve a resolution that amends the original resolution to allow for a true interest cost of up to 5.25% and also pushes the final date at which the bonds can be issued from December 31st of this year to April 30th of next year. If something were to happen in the market and we had to pull the sale that week, that first week of December, uh, we'd be getting back in. The earliest we could really get back in the market would likely be in January. And so we just need to have the flexibility to be able to do that. We don't expect that to happen. We don't expect to have any problems. Uh, we think the sale will go very well. And I think we'll end up below the original parameter approved by the board. But we just want to give ourselves the flexibility so that we don't have the have the sale uh, uh, disappear. Uh, we've met with the, both Moody's and Standard & Poor's on the financing. We fully expect them to affirm the outstanding ratings of the JPA debt, uh, which are uh, AA1 from Moody's, AAA from Standard & Poor's. They are to have those ratings to us next week. So by Friday of next week, we should know uh, what those ratings are. Um, Scott, yes. ask you a quick question. Yes. Is AA1 the highest for Moody's? It, AAA is actually the highest, so we're one notch down from the highest possible rating for Moody's. We are at the highest possible rating with Standard & Poor's. Did they give you any explanation as to why we're, we didn't? Oh, it ha I think it has to do with a lot of things. The city's outstanding rating, unlimited tax rating from Standard & Poor's is a AAA and a AAA for Moody's as well. Moody's, I think, uh, tends to notch things uh, oftentimes when we've created a, a special issuing authority like the joint public agency, they see that as being different than a voted unlimited tax authority issue of the city of Lincoln. Uh, I think maybe just the complexity of the financing puts them in the stage where they feel like it needs to be notched. There's also a, 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 a bit of a quirk in the, in the mechanics that when the, when the city or a school district, for example, has a voted issue for a fire station, for example, or, or water improvements, uh, storm sewer improvements. Voters approve that issue. The tax is put in place, the property tax is put in place in a rate sufficient to be making the debt service payments on the bonds. In our case with the JPA, we clearly never intend to have the JPA use its property taxing authority, but merely use the revenues from the arena and the associated area to, to make the debt service payments uh, on the bonds. And there's a lag that's involved if the JPA ever does need to levy the, the property taxes. So I think they see that as, as a bit of an issue as well. We, we did the, did a, I think we all did a great job of structuring the financing in a way that got us the, the highest possible ratings that we could. Uh, but it's, it's just a reality that we're the AA1 for Moody's. And again, a very, very strong rating, and because of that, we expect to see very, very low interest rates. I just wanted to mention that if these bonds are sold at a true interest cost of 4.25%, for example, our composite cost of borrowing for the entire JP, for all the JPA debt, would be approximately 3.78%. So, very, very low financing rate. Our budgeted rate was at 5%. 5%. 3.78 is the, the blended rate for everything? If, assuming these bonds end up getting sold at a 4.25%. At a With that, I'm happy to answer any other questions or turn it over to Mike if there are any questions from the legal side. Scott, just for, just for clarification to the public, what we're doing here is not with an anticipation that we'll jump above the 4.25, but with the idea that if we have to, we want to have the flexibility to wait to get the best deal that we can get, correct? That's correct. We have... I think it's important to say that to it's, the public. It, it's a little more difficult for us to anticipate where the rate will be, A, because market, the markets are moving so quickly, but also because the bonds are being sold at a competitive sale, so we're just having to rely on the bidders showing up and giving us competitive bids. And we would hate to have the low responsible bid be a 4.51%, which would still be very favorable, very, uh, very beneficial for the JPA and, 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 a, and a solid rate, but be forced to reject that bid just because the parameter that we put in place last spring uh, was so tight. 
I should mention this is also the last financing anticipated by the joint public agency. Uh, when we combine this with the turn back tax issue that was uh, uh, bonds that were issued by the city of Lincoln this summer uh, ought to complete all of our long term debt. So we're happy to be to this stage and, and have such a low composite expected rate. I don't have anything. I'd invite to you to <laughs> speak. It's a very straightforward. At the risk of making things worse. It's a very straightforward resolution, and, and Scott covered the items that were that were amended from the original bond resolution. Okay. Thank you both. If there are no further questions. Thank you. Is there public comment on this particular item? Uh, Jane Kinsey with Watchdogs. Um, What happens if uh, there is sud a sudden jump in rate that you're basing this on? Uh, as I said, that we are currently expecting that if we were to sell the bonds in today's market, we'd have a true interest cost somewhere between 4.25 and 4.4 percent. Uh, we were asking the board to give us the authority to have a true interest cost that's as high as 5.25 percent. If it does, if it jumps more than that then we would not hold the sale. We'd come back to the board and, and have another discussion. And what does that do to um, Lincoln or the JPA budget um, to financing, et cetera? The budget for the project currently has total debt service that exceeds what we will end up, what will likely end up with debt service for all of these combined bonds. As Regent Clare mentioned, the original budget was assuming that we had a cost of borrowing of 5%, and with this, we're closer to 3.78%. So God, we're well under the original budget and still under the ongoing budget uh, that has been created. Is that 378 Is that assuming worst case, did you say, at 525 No, that was at 4.25%, where I think we'll actually blended, end up being. What the blended rate? What would the blended rate be if we... If Worst case scenario, 5.25. Well, I, did, I didn't do the analysis at 5.25, but at 4.5, we ended up at a 3.8%. So I would suspect that's another 75 basis points, so another six basis points. Yeah, it takes us up to a 386 or something okay. as the so absolute worst still case. Still a point plus under what yes, we budgeted. That's correct. Okay. So that's under budget? Yeah. By what did you say? Uh, well, at 3.86, it's 1.14 under under budget. 1.14 percent. Yep. And we expect that to be a worst case scenario. Correct. Yeah, right. Right. Good point, Doug. So um, the ta the taxpayers are at risk if the arena does not produce as expected and you're covering uh, all bases in that um, possibility yes the the actually the, the primary source of revenues for repayment of the bonds is the occupation tax that's generating more revenues than we expect the arena itself to be generating uh, to help repay the bonds how much more and that's been a very stable source of revenues I I would turn to Steve Hubka on some of the details on that but this year we expect the occupation tax to generate over 13 million dollars of revenue okay so that's that's more than enough to cover the debt service and that's for 2013 yeah calendar 20 the year yes okay so were you going to say something then i was just going to point out Scott mentioned that for 2013 we're probably going to take in about 13.3 million dollars of occupation tax and in the ratings calls the other day we were going over this with Moody's and Standard and Poor's and our initial projections for this calendar year were less than 11 million so it's doing much better than was expected early on when we adopted the, the overall financial plan for the hay market, West Hay market. Okay and uh, do you expect that to continue? I believe it will. Uh, first of all, the projections only had a 1% inflation factor and a 1% population growth factor in there, and population growth is at least 1%. Uh, 
inflation is greater than 1% and the fact that people seem to continue to eat out more and more is definitely uh, benefiting us and in most of the months year to year we're seeing anywhere from a 2 to 7% increase from the prior year in those individual months. And how long will the turn back tax be in effect? It's got a sunset date, I think it's 2045. years. I think it's 2045 or 2046. It's when, 20. the, it's when the turn back tax bonds mature. Yeah. But there is a date that's in city code, is a hard and fast date. What was that? There is a hard and fast date in city code when that expires. Okay. Or, as Scott points out, when the bonds are retired. If and soon. do you know what that is in the city code? Uh, I, I think it's January 1, 2046, but I, I can get that to you. Okay. Okay, we will hope things go well. But even Tom Lorenz has stated that um, we're on a high right now with the arena. And um, it... Uh, we can't expect or we may not expect it to be that way in the future. So that means we have to bank it now, Jean? Hmm? That means we bank it now? What, the arena? No, we bank the money now that we're making extra so that we'll have that. Oh, definitely. Okay. I so, would think that would okay. be wise. I think, Steve, would it be a fair statement to say right now we're probably in, we're in a stronger financial position than we thought we'd be. We, we're borrowing money at less rate and we're making revenue at a rate at a higher rate at a higher rate yeah and our projections and I, I think you know, on a on a best case scenario I don't think people thought we thought this would happen so I mean although we can say yeah we're on a high right now we also have uh, financially things uh, are in a pretty good position for us right now Mm -hmm. Well, even Moody's has uh, downgraded a little bit because of some, uh, shall I say, skepticism or... Um, it didn't downgrade. Uh, it didn't downgrade. They rated us lower. It, a downgrade would be if they took us from AAA to a AA overnight. They didn't. The initial rating was was at a AA plus, or AA1, mm -hmm. uh, which, and, and that was just because of the lag. Mm -hmm. What would you call it rather than a downgrade? Uh, it, one notch from the highest possible rating category. Okay, <laughs> it's an incredibly uh, high quality rating and we're, we were very, very excited to be rated uh, AA1 by Moody's. And as I mentioned, it was, had, had nothing to do with what they saw as the viability of the arena solely based on the fact that we did the financing through a, an interlocal joint public agency that's a combination of the university and the, and the city of Lincoln and that the payments aren't coming from property taxes. The only way we would have gotten a AAA rating from Moody's is if we would have issued these bonds as unlimited tax voted debt of the city of Lincoln and it didn't, property didn't tax. make sense. It was purely paid by property tax. Okay. And I think we all recognize that it's much better for us to be paying it back from the wide variety of sources related to the arena and, and the redevelopment area and not from our property taxes. Definitely the taxpayers would think that. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Is there further public comment? All right, seeing none, do I have a motion to Second. approve WH 1393? Second. Second. The moved and seconded to adopt it. Uh, further discussion? All the roll. Emery? Yes. Claire? Yes. Beitler? Yes. It stands approved. The final substantive item on the agenda, number 12, WH 1394, uh, resolution approving a right of way contract. Rick Pale from City Law Department. Uh, before you is a, a right-of-way contract uh, between the City of Lincoln and the JPA to, for the city to purchase a permanent easement, a temporary easement needed for uh, part of the uh, new pumping station, the P Street pumping station. Uh, uh, the force main and lines from that uh, pumping station will transfer across JPA property, so those easements are, are needed. Um, the property involved was purchased from the Union Pacific Railroad back in 2010. At that point in time, it was appraised at $2 a square foot. 
and determining the value of the easements. Uh, the property was reappraised by Gary Hasselbrook, an independent appraiser. It was uh, a review appraisal of his appraisal was done by Fred Briggs. Uh, they reconfirmed a land value of $2 per square foot. In arriving at the value of the easements, um, they found that the easements would have a minimal impact on the uh, land value of the property. In fact, it would not change before or after. Uh, they, because of that, they uh, both arrived at a uh, figure of 25% of fee value for the permanent easement per square foot, and for the temporary, it's 10% of the fee value, which is uh, basically a one-year use of the property. I doubt if the property will take that much uh, length of time to put this work in, but um, the temporary easement 10% value is basically a standard practice. I think that's see that in all appraisals. Uh, the uh, permanent easement sometimes varies from 25 to 50% depending on the effect of the, on the property and future uses of the property. Here, this property is all within the 100-year uh, floodplain, even a portion in the 500-year floodplain. Uh, neither appraiser felt that there'd be any use of the property other than for public purposes. That's its highest and best use. And it really probably will be primarily floodplain storage. Uh, any, do you have any questions? How does this fee relate to the other easements that we've had in the area? I think uh, most of the other easements we've had have been on redeveloped property that we've been redeveloping. So the, the uh, it might have had just a, a little higher permanent easement value of the 50%. Those might be a permanent easement for a, a, a skywalk bridge, permanent easements for some other facilities, but they would be on property that's been redeveloped and usable for commercial or residential purposes and not, uh, not in this type of situation and it took away from usable square footage. Here we don't feel that this would remove any usable square footage from the, uh, the public use. Will this interfere with any, any of the activities that are happening down in the... No, this is, uh, all this land is west of the relocated railroad tracks. And as I said, it's floodplain, it's designated, I think, used, that's going to be flood storage areas. Further questions, Rick? It's not as a public comment on this particular item. Jane Kinsey with Rotch Dogs. Is there a fin is there a, a monetary amount connected to this, or is it just a contract? There's a there's a five thousand dollar more or less a five thousand uh, dollar charge on the permanent easement and two to three thousand on the temporary. I don't, I've forgotten the exact figures. 86, Small amount. 8,600 total. 8,600 total. Okay, thank you. All right, is there any other public comment? If not, do I have a motion to approve 1394? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Further discussion? All the roll. Amory? Yes. Claire? Yes. Beitler? Yes. The resolution is approved uh, without objection. The next meeting date is Thursday, December 19th, 2013 at 3 p.m. in room 303. Uh, is that all right with you, gentlemen? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Well, I don't know, should we sing happy birthday or just close the meeting? <laughs> well, Yesterday, my staff sang happy birthday to me earlier, and they did a bang-up job, so well, I think it'd be all right if we just passed on this occasion. Yeah. Second. It's been moved and seconded for the discussion. Call the roll. Emery? Yes. Claire? Yes. Beitler? Yes. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>